Good evening. Before the people were freed from Egypt, from Mitzrayim, we all know that God wanted to show everyone his strength and to punish the Egyptians for what they've done. So God tells Moses and Aaron to tell the Jewish people that they're about to be redeemed and go to Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh that it's time to be freed from Egypt. God tells Moses, I'm going to harden your heart. I'm going to harden the heart of Pharaoh. And I'm going to bring plagues to force Pharaoh to let the Jewish people go. With this started the plagues. After every plague, there was a warning for about two, three weeks, and another plague started. Pharaoh refused, and then God brought more plagues upon the Jewish people, uh, upon the Egyptians. In this class, we're going to discuss plague number two, which we all know is the plague of the frogs. So, frogs is a unique word without any direct translation. So if you, if you look at many different commentaries, the word Tzfardeya can be translated to either an alligator or a crocodile, or it can be translated, as you see here, to just the idea of frogs. Now, let's take the opinion that it's frogs and out of all creatures, why did God choose frogs to attack the Egyptians? So there's a fascinating medrash that says, explains different reasons for different creatures in the world. The medrash says that wasps and frogs seem not to have any purpose in this world. But Hashem specifically created them in order to punish Canaan, which is the, the people, the Canaanim that lived in Egypt, in, the, in Israel, before the Jewish people arrived there, as it says in the Madrash. But before we in this commentary, let's explain about the wasps. So, before the Jewish people were enter the land, after they spent 40 years in the desert, Hashem took these, these wasps, which, which was a, uh, supposedly it was like a little mosquito, and he poked the Canaanim in their eyes before the Jewish people arrived to allow an easier battle for the Jews. But let's speak about the frogs. It says in the Medrash, if not for the frogs, how would God punish the Egyptians? <laughs> so wait a minute, there's many questions. First of all, it's not the only plague. There's another nine plagues. So if not for the frogs, he would have nine plagues left. Number two, it wasn't the first plague. So it's not like it was even what we started with. It's the second plague. And number three, there are plagues that are much more severe. Let's talk about even making the blood, the water into blood. They couldn't, they couldn't water their fields. And never mind the final plague, which all the firstborn buying, dying, that's for sure a very severe plague. <laughs> and it'd be, God has many messengers. And if not for the frogs, how would he punish the Egyptians? There's many different ways how he would punish the Egyptians. And as we see in actuality, that he punished the Egyptians without the frogs. Well, if we look in the commentaries, there's two opinions. 
there are the sages, and then there's a Rabbi Acha Barachanina. <laughs> Even though they're both speaking about something very similar, there's a small difference between them. Our sages say everything has a purpose, and especially fleas and mosquitoes. Rav Acha says, especially scorpions and snakes. So again, the sages say everything has a purpose, especially fleas and mosquitoes. Rav Acha says everything has a purpose, especially snakes and scorpions. What's the difference? Well, fleas and mosquitoes, the Talmud explains, they have a purpose, which means as follows. Even something annoying, like a fly, he also has a purpose. Rav Acha says, even things that are on a higher level, like snakes and scorpions, they're also destructive, which means they are harmful. Even those things like snakes and scorpions that are harmful, they also have some great purpose in this world. Now, frogs have no purpose at all. And seems to be they have no purpose and also they're harmless. So why do we bring an example of frogs? Now, let's try to explain a little deeper meaning behind this whole discussion in order for us to understand, in order for us to understand the idea of the frogs. Okay, so let's, um, let's go into this a little, a little deeper. Um, you know, a According to the Hasidic philosophy, there's a lot deeper meaning behind each plague. You know, the conventional explanation why God brought plagues was to punish the Egyptians. They were cruel. We are punishing them. But there was another point here. A deeper meaning is God wanted to prove that he's God. Look what I can do. This is another deeper meaning behind the plagues. Not just to revenge them and to revenge from the Egyptians. God wanted to prove, as we see here in the chart, you will know that I am God. I am God in the midst of Egypt. And the hail... There is none like me in the entire earth. This is the real deeper meaning of the plagues. Now, now that we've established that the plagues are not only to punish, but also to prove that I am God, let's see how the frogs play a role in all of this. You know, we all know there are many people, unfortunately, that for whatever reason it is, they don't believe in God. Okay. In this chart, we have three different types of people. Number one, they believe that God, they believe in God, but they also believe that God has helpers, meaning God hired the sun to shine in the world. Now the sun could decide when to shine, when not to shine. God hired the moon. So the moon could decide when to shine, when not to shine. God hired the rain. The rain could decide when it wants to rain and when it doesn't want to rain. Well, this is obviously not believing that God controls everything. Now, Bilaam, we know Bilaam in his prophecy, he said, of course, I can't do anything without God.
I cannot do anything without God, but I also have power. This is what's Bilam's um, complaint. So the Talmud refers to these kind of people. They believe in God, but they're not completely devoted to God. They believe in something else. They believe in other things. I believe in the sun. I believe in the moon. That's the first level. The second level is a little more severe, as we're going to discuss right now. The second level is as follows. I believe in a higher power, but I'm not ready to submit to God. And this is what Paro said. Listen to what Paro said, evil man. My river is my own and I made myself. My river is my own and I made myself. That's it. He doesn't deny God, but he says, I made myself and I'm everything. Now we go to the third level, which is a atheist. An atheist basically says, I don't believe in God at all. There's no God. It's not existing. I created myself. Everything got created from a bang, and that's it. At first glance, say that an atheist is the worst because he denies in everything. But on the second hand, an atheist is not so bad. Because the fact that he keeps on saying, I don't believe in God, I don't believe in God, there is no God, he keeps on talking a lot about God. You know when someone has an enemy and they keep on bringing up their enemy? I don't care about him. He doesn't bother me. I'm not interested in him. I'm not even going to pay any attention to him. I'm not even going to allow him to cause me to lose sleep. Here you are talking about him all day. You're so mad at him that you can't stop thinking about him. Again. You're focusing on him. An atheist, in a way, has so much belief in God that he has to try so hard to get rid of it and keeps on saying, no, there's no God. No, there's no God. So because he keeps on fighting and he keeps on challenging it means deep inside he does believe in God. You know, we discussed that there's three different types of animal souls, as we see here in the, in the photo. Stubborn, aggressive. Now, at least the aggressive one cares. And let's explain what this means. You know, the opposition of an atheist is like the ox, which basically means the atheist, the fact that he invests passion to fight against the existence of God, he feels a significant connection with God. But the second level that we mentioned before, he says, I created myself. I'm not dependent on anything else. Let's explain what's God's core purpose of this creation of the world. Everything he created was for his honor. Anything that's created in this world, Hashem created for himself. Because the purpose is to reveal godliness. When you realize that your house your car, your food, your belongings, everything is created for the purpose of getting closer to God. More glory of God in your life and in this world. Some things the purpose is revealed, sometimes you don't see it. You might be involved in business, you might be involved in several things, but you don't see the purpose. Some things you don't see any purpose at all. But when you go into it a little deeper, you see 
that there is a purpose in everything. Other things are not only purposeless, they're actually harmful, like snakes and scorpions. Then there's a third thing, not good and not bad. They mind their own business. Now, the second level, like snakes and scorpions, at least they're fighting against life. At least they're harmful. And they could fight against the wicked. But the frog is the opposite of any purpose whatsoever. He has no power. He pretty much does nothing. So you're going to say, wait a minute. What is this frog's purpose in the world? Now we can go back full circle and understand why the frog was used to fight the Egyptians. The snakes and the scorpions and other animals that are destructive reveal godliness through being destructive like the atheist. But the frog, it's hard to realize its connection with godliness. And therefore, Rav Acha said, why did, if not for the frogs, how would God punish the Egyptians? Which means, frogs show on the philosophy of the Egyptians. Maybe God exists, but it has nothing to do with me. I couldn't care less about him. He means nothing. He means zero to me. This is the purpose of the plagues. It's not only a punishment, but it's also to teach them about the existence of God. The frog is the perfect example. The frog went into the ovens. He was ready to give up his life to show the Egyptians that there's a God. When the Egyptians saw that even the frogs play a role in the master plan of the world, God created everything in this world. That mosquito, that rat that's annoying you, the bee. Bees, we know, they create honey, but a mosquito could be a perfect example. Everything in this world has a purpose, even the frogs. And then when they realize that the frogs are here to come and fight them, and they're ready to go in the oven and, and, and hurt themselves, they realize that everything in this world is for a purpose. There's no such thing to say, God forbid, that God is not involved in my life. You know, I was once knocking on, uh, I was knocking on someone's door to ask them if they're Jewish and to ask them if they want to light the Shabbat candles. So I, I um, knock on the door, they say, and they say, um, they slam the door in my face. Now, the one that slams the door in your face, Judaism is the strongest inside him, and that's why he's trying to fight it. It's so strong inside him that because it's so strong, he was ready to, because his, his godly desire is so strong inside him, he's trying to fight it. If his godly desire wasn't so strong, he would never open the door. So he's the person that you have to keep on working and trying to inspire. Him. So even though the atheist wants to weaken his belief in God, they're not the worst in the agenda of the world. The fact that they fight, it's because they have a strong belief. And the negative energy could be changed to positive energy. But the one that doesn't believe, he has no interest. And this is the truth, on the, and this is the truth out of this entire thing. Having a drive is the most important. Are we alive because we're not dead? or we're actually alive? Are we alive because God forbid we didn't get hit by a truck or we're actually, thank God, alive? 
The same thing is with your relationship with God. Don't say, I don't care. I couldn't give a hoot about Shabbat, about kosher, about Judaism. I really, I really don't care. No. The one that's trying to fight, that's the one that has energy. And you could always turn that negative energy to positive energy. The ones that try to fight Judaism are the ones that's the easiest to end up making them closer because they have a drive. Of course, we shouldn't become atheists. That's a terrible behavior. But try not to say, I don't care. Whatever it may be, whether it's in business, whether it's in Judaism, do not say, I don't care. I can't be bothered. Do not say that from your mouth or even from your heart. And you'll realize you'll have much more power and passion with what you're doing. Try to engage in many different ways. And you'll see that there's a lot to worry about. Try not to be like Paro. Try to be like Moses. Or if you're not quite there yet, at least stick with the sense, at least stick with the snakes and not the frogs. That way, eventually, you'll come around. And besides, frogs are cold. Frogs have no life. It's a very cold way of living. So the point we take from today is try to be warm with passion. When we have passion and we have meaning, then our lives are going to have much more excitement. And that's the idea of the Tzvardeya. The Tzvardeya seemed not to have any meaning. That alone was how we punished the Egyptians. They used to say, I don't care about God. God means nothing to us. Here you see that something that seemed to be insignificant became extremely important. We should take our mundane, day-to-day -day things and connect it with spirituality and bring out its importantness for the way of our lives. Thank you very much. Great message, Rabbi Main.